So we are trying to build these devices based on the use of uh, uh, nanomaterials, nanotechnologies, and make this useful also for a lot of other applications that may include even uh, biomarkers for cancer, biomarkers for other diseases, including uh, environmental monitoring, safety and security. And the other example, well known, is also uh, lateral flow or paper-based sensor. So you all know these. And in fact, this kind of device uh, nowadays is well known because Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World, where the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And also we have a free MSE company database categorized by industry sector, location, as well as internship and full-time titles. So if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the description below. And now let's get on to the episode. Today's guest is Dr. Arben Mercochi a professor and director of the Nanobioelectronics and Biosensors Group at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Barcelona. His research focuses on the design and application of cutting edge nanotechnology and nanobiosensors with a focus on diagnostic devices. He has published around 300 peer review research papers. He's an editor for several books in his field, and he's also the co-founder of two spin-off companies. He is a very well-known thought leader in this space, so we're very appreciative to have you here, Arben. It's a pleasure for me, too. Thank you very much for the invitation. Awesome. So yeah, to start today, could you tell us what exactly is a nanobiosensor and what nanomaterials are they typically comprised of? A uh, nanobiosensor is a device that is used to measure something. Let me give you an example uh, of the bi nanobiosensors we are working with. And I'll start with uh, two examples. Uh, the first one is similar with a glucose biosensor that people suffering diabetes are using. And you can find this biosensor in any uh, pharmacy in the world. So it's similar, this one that I have in my hands here. So we have this disposable part and we have this tiny instrument that you use to measure something. For example, people suffering diabetes may measure the glucose uh, uh, or uh, you can measure whatever you want. So we are trying to build these devices based on the use of uh, uh, nanomaterials, nanotechnologies, and make this useful also for a lot of other applications that may include even uh, biomarkers for cancer, biomarkers for other diseases, including uh, environmental monitoring, safety and security. And the other example, well known, is also uh, lateral flow or paper-based sensor. So you all know these. And in fact, this kind of device uh, nowadays is well known because uh, for COVID-19 uh, uh, monitoring, diagnostics is used as a rapid test. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there is nanotechnology in both of these devices. If you see these tiny lines here, the red lines correspond to gold nanoparticles that we use for uh, measuring. So these kind of devices integrating inside nanotechnology, integrated inside nanomaterials, nanoparticles, for example, or graphene are called nanobiosensors. And to use these for different applications, uh, being uh, diagnostics, health-related diagnostics, one of the most important. So what advantages do uh, nanobiosensors provide compared to what was previously used in the biosensing space? Yeah. As I said, uh, these uh, devices nowadays uh, that incorporate uh, uh, nanomaterials and nanoparticles are bringing advantages. And one of the most important advantages is in these cases that I showed you, these uh, tiny devices, is that they are bringing more sensitivity, for example. So, for example, in the case of COVID-19 or in the case of application of these tiny devices in uh, other areas, uh, thanks to the use of nanoparticles, the, the, the high sensitivity they, are, they offer, it's possible to use these devices even for diagnostics of other diseases, of course, for the moment in research lab level, for example, cancer biomarkers, or we are using this uh, also for detection of uh, uh, bacteria and other applications. So nanotechnology, nanomaterials are bringing more sensitivity 
lower detection limit sometimes, but also in other configurations, uh, uh, not only these, but also wearable devices or even implanted devices, uh, smaller devices that may be useful for other applications. For example, in case of glucose, there are nowadays implanted uh, uh, glucose biosensors that uh, make the life of uh, the people suffer suffering diabetes easier. So they have this device that in a very discrete mode is measuring glucose and they even may have uh, the, the corrector of the insulin. Everything is connected. So uh, sensing, biosensor, diagnostic, therapy, and uh, in a so-called uh, trianostic platform. So, I mean, and all these in most of the cases are thanks to the nanotechnology, nanomaterials that are either improving existing devices or building brand new devices with interest for a lot of other applications. Yeah, you mentioned gold and graphene in your explanations of some of the materials used in the sensing. Could you go into more detail about how those materials are used in the nanobiosensors to uh, have sensitivity towards different diseases? Uh, for example, in the case of gold nanoparticles, this is now one of the classical nanomaterials, one of the first ones used, explored a lot in uh, nanotechnology. Gold nanoparticles are tiny particles uh, uh, of around, uh, uh, let's say, 20, 10 to 20 nanometer. And what we do with these uh, nanoparticles, we connect these uh, using some uh, chemistry, uh, for example, using some tile groups with uh, uh, DNA sequences or using some other uh, chemistry. Uh, we call this uh, covalent bonding with antibodies or other receptors. So imagine we have these uh, uh, small spheres uh, of gold nanoparticles connected to a receptor that are going to recognize, uh, let's say, a cancer cell or a virus. And these uh, tiny particles uh, has this capability to give a signal that is uh, uh, very well captured and with a high sensitivity because in comparison to other previously used materials, including enzymes that have been used and still are used in systems called, for example, ELISA, nanoparticles have a stronger signaling capability. And in addition, they are stable because for these devices, that if you want these devices to be distributed to the end users nowadays, for example, yeah, I'm taking again the, the case of the, the example of COVID, you need to distribute these devices everywhere in the world. You need to have these devices very stable. So nanoparticles inside are very stable. If you put uh, instead enzymes or other uh, biological molecules are less stable. Nanomaterials are bringing stability to uh, the device. Uh, in the case of graphene, there are other advantages. For example, uh, graphene is a very nice material to build uh, highly sensitive electrical based uh, devices where the problem of signal to noise ratio, usually the, some uh, kind of uh, uh, sensors are suffering problems related to noises. And uh, one of the contribution of graphene is that is offering stable measurements, electrical measurements, given these uh, electronic characteristics where graphene is uh, uh, improving this uh, performance of these sensors. And sometimes graphene is used even as modifier of the sensing surface. So there are a lot of different applications where graphene or graphene related materials can be applied for uh, sensors or biosensors. The same, in fact, for uh, gold nanoparticles. So there are a lot of possibilities. This is a huge research field where since uh, more than a decade, uh, a lot of research groups, including us, is contributing to understand, first of all, what is uh, uh, the advantages, what are the new detection phenomena, detection uh, principles that can be coupled to sensors and biosensors. And, and in fact, uh, the results are really very, very interesting. But still, there is a lot of work to do to make the systems uh, stable enough, uh, to be, make the systems robust, and of course, reach the performance requested for these kind of applications. Interesting. So going off of David's question, with these gold nanoparticles, graphene, um, nanotubes as well, um, is there a biocompatibility issue or does functionalizing it with, you know, DNA or enzymes um, reduce or eliminate that uh, biocompatibility 
uh, potential problem. Compatibility is uh, an important problem issue, and we always uh, are concerned about this. Uh, but uh, we should distinguish uh, the designs, the, the architectures we are speaking about. Uh, uh, there are two different kinds of uh, uh, biosensors. There are biosensors, as those ones that I showed you, that are usually applied for in vitro applications. So it means that uh, they are not uh, inserted, uh, connected to the, the body. The issues related to biocompatibility or toxicity, etc., uh, are not that uh, sensitive as, for example, uh, if you have an implanted device or wearable device where the, the nanomaterial may be in contact directly with the body. So there are two different things. Even for us, working with uh, devices like this one that is for in vitro application. Still, we are very much interested to use uh, sustainable material. This is why we are working with uh, uh, paper-based sensors, also nitrocellulose, because uh, of course, this device is not going to be in contact with the body. You just take your sample and you put it there and you get the result. But still, we don't want to generate uh, uh, wastes and generate problems or the environment. So we are interested to use uh, sustainable, but compatible materials that do not generate uh, toxic or not are not related at all with toxic material. But if you are speaking about implantable devices, there is a lot of work and, uh, and colleagues working in this field uh, are for always uh, taking care of uh, uh, studies, deep studies, about the, the compatibility, uh, uh, toxicity of materials they are using. And in fact, the, the efforts are driven toward uh, nanomaterials that are not uh, uh, creating any problem for the body or during measurement, they are separated with some special membranes that do not put this direct in contact with the body. But you, you in a, some interfaces, you take the sample and the sample is penetrating the membrane and then getting in contact with nanomaterial. So, I mean, there are a lot of uh, strategies and, and precautions uh, taken while working with nanomaterials. But of course, uh, all these uh, are under search and under study so as to avoid any side effect that may be even worse than uh, the problem one is trying to solve. But I'm sure that the people working with implanted devices uh, have this in mind. And uh, in fact, there are a lot of uh, uh, works, very nice works, uh, research uh, in this direction. Yeah. So when you look for new nano biosensing materials for either sustainability or for new sensing, what property are you looking for? And is it common for each, uh, for each thing, for sustainability and for new sensing? Are you looking for one common property for new materials? We are working with nanomaterials and each time we want to apply nanomaterial in biosensors, uh, we are looking to different properties. Uh, sometimes the nanomaterial is, uh, because you know, the architecture of a biosensor is rather complex. So, so I, didn't, uh, I couldn't explain it in detail, but if you consider, for example, this biosensor and the sensor in fact is this uh, uh, here, this uh, tiny disposable part, in this part, uh, we put uh, uh, some receptors. Uh, there are inside some receptors. It may be an enzyme, it can be an antibody. And then we may use some other antibodies, secondary antibody, we call these, that connect with uh, nanoparticles as labeled. But uh, uh, nanoparticles may be either as signaling tool, so up in the upper part, or maybe in the uh, sensing part, so the so called transducer. So depending in which part you are put, putting uh, your, your nanomaterial, the role the, the, is different. For example, for uh, nanomaterials that would be used as labels, we are looking for properties that uh, may be either electrical uh, or optical uh, that are useful and advantageous for uh, the use as, uh, uh, as label as signaling tool. But if you use a material in the transducer part, so in the, the bottom, uh, then we use uh, uh, nanomaterials that uh, have uh, some special electronic properties. So the current that we are measuring is measured in the proper way. So uh, the, the system is rather complex, but uh, uh, the properties should be very carefully used. Uh, and of course, uh, as we are working also in 
preparation some kind of nanomaterials and also other groups are working with this. Uh, we try to tune the properties of nanomaterials according to the specific application. So this is really a very amazing field of research where you should know very well the properties of nanomaterials and take advantages of their properties and even tune their size and other properties, doping the nanoparticles, for example, so as to get the best for your application. One of the challenges we have in general, uh, people working in uh, uh, design and uh, preparation and application, of course, of nanobase sensors is uh, uh, we call cost efficiency. So we want to have uh, cheap, relatively cheap uh, nanobase sensors, but also at the same time keeping the performance. Because in a lot of applications where you need these bio sensors uh, to be used in a massive way for uh, detection, for example, of uh, in the case of pandemics, for example, as nowadays, but also in applications in environmental monitoring, where you need uh, to use a lot of sensors because you need to distribute these uh, everywhere so people can use it, even students or pupils, uh, uh, kids, if they go in, the, in some uh, tours, uh, they can just uh, use this simple uh, test uh, and measure if the water, the river is okay or not. Uh, so a lot of, so we, we involve on the involvement of citizens in uh, the use and control of the, the environment is also very important. So I'm giving this example to, to say that uh, the cost of the devices is very important. And to have these uh, devices uh, uh, cost efficient, you need a lot of work to do. It looks like simple because uh, we are speaking about paper-based sensor where you have nitrocellulose, but uh, the previous studies related to this. Uh, so the choosing, for example, of nanoparticles, uh, the right nanoparticles, the right size, the right connection with the receptors and making the receptors, keeping their uh, affinity for the, the, the detection. There are a lot of issues. So all these issues, you need to pay attention and you need to put a lot of efforts uh, for in, during the research. So there is a lot of work to do to make these devices really useful so as to have the right performance uh, we need for the specific application, either in uh, health-related diagnostic, but also for environmental monitoring. So I think uh, making these devices strong enough uh, that uh, uh, are going to show the right performance without uh, uh, any false, positive, negative results, which is very, very important uh, for people because it may be related to, of course, it is related to our life, our health is related to the security, uh, depending on the application. And this is uh, what is uh, still necessary. And sometimes we need uh, not only to have a, a sensor for a nanobio sensor for a single application, single parameter, but also we need to, to, to have sensors that are for multi-detection. We call this multi-parametric. And in multi-parametric, this is very important because uh, some clinical scenarios, either for cancer or even for uh, viruses are complex. You need to detect several uh, things. For example, in case of uh, 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 cancer, you may need probably to detect uh, more than two, three proteins or or RNAs, uh, or in case of uh, uh, viruses, you need to detect uh, different kinds of viruses because you may have probably uh, different kinds of viruses. Or if you want to detect uh, antibodies generated after infections, you may have different antibodies. And in, uh, depending on the period you are making the control, the time frame, uh, you may have different uh, composition. So you need to detect simultaneously different things. Uh, and this uh, may be much more useful for the taking the, the right uh, uh, response in terms of diagnostics and afterwards uh, uh, having the right decision in terms of therapy, whatever 
you need to take. When you talk about the nano biosensing for cancer, we want to dive more into how exactly that works. So just a little bit more background is that one very impactful application that, that you guys have worked on involves the detection of cancer cells using gold nanoparticles. How exactly can you functionalize these nanoparticles with specific receptors to detect these different types of cancer cells? Yeah, uh, this has been, in fact, one of the previous works we have uh, working with uh, in collaboration with our colleagues uh, of biologic de department here at the campus of Autonomous University of Barcelona. So if you, are to, if you want to, to, to build a platform that is useful for uh, cancer cell detection, you need to have information, first of all, about the, the typical cancer cells. In our case, uh, we had this information. In fact, we worked with some cancer cells, model cancer cells, uh, for which uh, the, the antigens, uh, the proteins in the, the membrane of the cancer cells were well known. So this is the first condition because the kind of sensors we are applying for cancer uh, cell detection were based on the uh, let's say immunosensors, they were nanoparticles connected with antibodies that were recognizing these uh, uh, antigens on top of the cancer cells. So, and knowing which antigens, which proteins you have on top of the cells is very important to find uh, the right uh, uh, ant uh, receptor antibody you need to connect uh, with this antigen. In addition, the, our system was a little bit more complex because we combined the detection of cancer cells with the use of some magnetic beads. Uh, it was a kind of sandwich system. So we have these magnetic beads modified with an uh, antibody that recognize this cancer cell. So they can capture these uh, even in a, a plasma or whatever uh, physiological fluid. And then other antibodies connected with golden particles were recognizing some other antigens remaining on top of the cancer cell. So imagine you have the cancer cell sandwiched between uh, uh, antibodies and big uh, magnetic beads and very small nanoparticles. And all this uh, uh, conjugate uh, was captured using a magnetic field. Uh, so in this way, we are able to separate the cancer cells for the matrix of the blood. In, and afterwards, of course, uh, detecting these uh, uh, cancer cells using some electrical method. So this is the way uh, I, uh, we have been working with. Uh, and as I said, very, very important in this area, uh, the, the knowledge, information, and collaboration, of course, with uh, experts in cancer cells, biology, so as to design the, the, the sensor in a proper way. So we need this information before designing the sensor. That's fascinating. So I know that these cancer diagnoses are totally life-changing and it seems like a, a complex mechanism to um, detect uh, these different cancer cell types. So is it possible to fine tune these sensors to minimize or completely eliminate either false po positives or false negatives? I think uh, this, uh, this is very challenging. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm speaking uh, more about the biosensor and nanobiosensor, the technology, but uh, our technology, the nanobiosensor, depends a lot on the quality of the receptors. Uh, and uh, most of the false positive, false negative results are related to the, the receptor. So if you have not the right receptors with the right specificity, selectivity, uh, you may have these problems. But of course, uh, uh, some problems related to the false negative positive results may be related to the, uh, the architecture itself of the biosensor, where you may have some uh, uh, non-specific adsorptions uh, uh, that may generate these uh, uh, negative, uh, false negative or positive results. Uh, so this is why when you build a nanobiosensor, we should we take care of uh, the modification of the surface, controlling of all the receptors, how these are immobilized on top of the sensor, optimizing all the components using some uh, extra materials that uh, block the, the free spaces. So you have not space uh, for uh, some uh, non-specific adsorption. So this is a, a very, very careful uh, designed architecture that uh, should ensure all these properties. But of course, uh, this is uh, not easy and still there are problems and this in general, because there are a lot of factors 
generate uh, uh, problems, sometimes uh, false negative results, positive results, and so on, uh, that we are trying to solve. Yeah. So you said before that we can combine nanobiosensing with phone apps to get real-time sensing of our uh, body signs. How would that affect our lives? Uh, this is also very, very interesting. And in fact, uh, we are working with uh, a coupling of uh, this uh, biosensor also with a uh, smartphone. For example, I, again, uh, you know, everyone nowadays has a smartphone and you have this uh, tiny device uh, that you can read directly. And in fact, in some applications, you just uh, may read this as yes or no. You know, you have these two lines, red lines, and you have one control line, and you have the detection line. So always you should have this control line appeared in this test. Uh, and as far as for the, the detection line, you just, uh, uh, with naked eye, you can just say yes or no. But in some application, if you want to know more about uh, the, the level, the quantity of whatever you are detecting, and we call this in... in in this application, if you want to convert this device from a qualitative device to a quantitative device, you need to quantify the intensity of these lines that appear here in this device. And by using smartphone, you can uh, take images and using some apps that are able to treat these images, we can uh, evaluate the strength of the color and correlate this with the quantity of whatever you want to detect. Uh, so in this way, in a very simple mode, sometimes it's more complicated. It's not that simple because depending on the kind of nanobiosensor, we need probably to do uh, an adapter to tap uh, to the smartphone. If we want, for example, to have some uh, special excitation, not uh, the, the typical measurements where in case of gold nanoparticles, we are working with uh, in open air. So we are just looking to the UV visible uh, excitation of golden particles. So we see this, this red line and we can just measure with smartphone, but sometimes you need to excite the particles probably in a different mode and you need to, to, to measure in the dark uh, uh, environment and so on. So, I mean, the smartphone can be used as a, a, a instrument to measure the intensity of the line, or we can do some more sophisticated things. Uh, we can connect even smartphone with some electrical measurements, even with uh, antenna and so on. So we can power the sensor, giving some energy and do some measurements. So nowadays, this is a, a, a very, very interesting field of research. And we are trying to understand, first of all, the, the needs and then trying to develop uh, designs, uh, technologies that may be coupled and uh, make possible the use of the biosensor in the best way and of course, uh, uh, to give solutions to uh, needs either, either for health or, or environmental monitoring. So this is really a very, very fascinating field, field of research. So that smartphone pairing capability seems to me like it might be um, really beneficial in the glucose monitoring space, potentially like measuring the quantitative updates. And then if it's uh, getting too high near that threshold, then it can provide notifications straight to your phone. Am I understanding that possibility correctly? Is that something that we could see in the future? Is that pairing of like glucose uh, sensors with our smartphone? Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, this is an emerging field, as I said. So I think in the future, there will be a lot of other applications. So where People will take advantages of uh, the smartphone uh, to have this uh, as a device that may control and make the, the, the life easier. Uh, for example, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, there are some simple application inserted in the smartphone where you can measure the heart rate, you can measure uh, some physical parameters, temperature, whatever. But uh, uh, what about having this uh, very easy, for example, for glucose measurements or for uh, other uh, parameters, uh, even related to the toxicity or even in an environment to see if there is uh, onto some surfaces, if there are some bacteria to be sure that you are in a clean space or in a water, if you go somewhere and want to use this water for whatever you want uh, to do a simple test and just with your smartphone to get a, a fast response uh, or people at home that are during some 
uh, uh, some ther therapeutical uh, processes, uh, taking some drugs. Uh, they, instead of going to the hospital to see if uh, uh, the drugs have had uh, effect, uh, uh, they just may take uh, a fast uh, uh, diagnostic using their devices and smartphone and get the results uh, and be quiet and don't no need to go to the hospital and even can get this uh, result uh, to the doctor office and doctor can follow the patients without uh, uh, transferring them, translating them uh, to the hospital, which will be uh, very, very convenient for the people, but also uh, saving a lot uh, uh, for the public ha health uh, insurance and all these uh, uh, issues that are related to the expenses of the, the, the health uh, uh, system that is uh, uh, more and more charged with a lot of expenses, of course, because uh, there are a lot of issues, elder people, uh, issues related to a lot of diseases, pandemics. Uh, so we need uh, to have these uh, devices that uh, may solve this problem. So, and this can be solved only having these devices cost efficient, easy to be used, uh, even at home uh, without the need for specialized people. So this is very important. Now, that's a really good point. Like hospital bills, I know that's a very prevalent issue. Um, it can get very expensive, especially in, with the U.S. like healthcare system. So, yeah. really, any 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 sensors would be cheaper than cheaper than a hospital bill. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to, you mentioned bacteria, you mentioned um, water detection systems. And so we wanted to move on from the cancer cell detection to another very unique application, which is food quality control and water quality control. So um, instead of detecting cancer cells, you can detect E. coli in food and water samples um, using these nanobiosensors. And so I was just wondering in what ways can you change these receptors on these nanoparticles to be used for a completely different application like E. coli detection? Uh, in fact, uh, we have been working also with these because uh, uh, we are mostly focused on the technology, but as far as for application, either in clinical area or environmental monitoring, we collaborate with uh, partners, experts in the fields. So in the case of a banana biosensor that uh, uh, is uh, applied, for example, to detect bacteria, uh, there are some similarity with the one that maybe is used uh, to detect uh, some biological components or even cancer cells. And the analogy is this, that uh, uh, in the case of bacteria, we also are using antibodies that uh, uh, can detect uh, uh, the, the antigens, uh, the proteins you have on top of the bacteria. Uh, the same as the, the nanobiosensor for cancer cells, where we put some antibodies that are detecting antigens on top of the cancer cells. So still we are using antibodies, but are specific antibodies uh, against this uh, specific bacteria. Uh, so the analogy is here, but of course you need to uh, pay attention to other issues uh, because uh, for example, the size uh, of uh, the analyte you are using, working with, uh, and overall the, the kind of sample. So usually uh, in case of bacteria, you may need to, to work with water or sea water or river drinking water or some food you need to extract probably or do some separation uh, from the food uh, and trying to, to take out uh, bacteria and put this on top of the sensor. So uh, uh, the scenario uh, that uh, you need to address is very important because it may make a huge difference in the architecture of the sensor. So I want, uh, I'm always trying to give the message that uh, you cannot have a universal base sensor that can work uh, uh, for any kind of sample I, either, uh, although it may be for bacteria, but if you want to detect bacteria in blood or bacteria in water, it, the sensor can be totally different because the issue of the sample, the issue of possible interference uh, will make difference in the way how the sensor is designed. So these are very, very important uh, uh, characteristics that we keep in mind while designing the biosensor and of course, applying this uh, according to the needs. Fascinating, it'd be huge if we could uh, get that type of feedback instantly, especially out in uh, more developing countries when you don't know whether or not it's safe. Um, moving on to another part of the field that you talked about before, but. Similar to other rapidly growing areas in material science, 
The Nets advancement with native biosensors involves training your sensors via machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, what opportunities are there for future innovations around machine learning and AI, uh, specifically around the false positives and false negatives are there? Machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence are uh, very, very interesting. And uh, there is a, a lot of interest nowadays uh, to couple diagnostic platforms with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. In fact, uh, uh, before designing a sensor, for example, in diagnostic, you need to, to know what kind of biomarker you are going to detect. If you are going to detect, for example, a biomarker for cancer, you need to, do, to know the specific uh, biomarker that you need to address. But sometimes the situation is not that clear. You may, may have several biomarkers you need to detect. And these several, these several biomarkers are in fact deduced from previous studies of experts in clinical area uh, trying to discover these biomarkers because uh, they work with uh, uh, thousands of thousands of sam samples and then uh, different uh, uh, components that may affect uh, and then may be useful for cancer detection, for example, biomarkers. So the selection of these biomarkers, nowadays uh, there is a tendency also to use machine learning and uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, to get these biomarkers. And then once you have these biomarkers, the, 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 the representative ones uh, that may be transferred to nanobiosensor for a simple monitoring as a tracer, let's say, for the diagnostics, uh, uh, using machine learning or artificial intelligence is very, very important because uh, uh, there are complex situations where these uh, biomarkers in different samples are changing a lot. Uh, so you need probably to train your sensor according to the different scenarios where uh, different kinds of samples uh, that may, 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 be, uh, may be faced uh, during the diagnostic. So uh, you need to, to, to work with a lot of data previously and uh, using this uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence methods uh, may uh, solve the issues related to interferences, uh, uh, complex samples, where the situation is not that uh, easy, where you have just uh, one single parameters and you just need to measure the quantity of it. Uh, but uh, in real life, in real applications, you may have a lot of factors. So a lot of, uh, uh, incognite, so unknown parameters that may affect the response. And you, you can imagine the system is very, very complex. And for these kind of applications, I think uh, the future uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning may be very, very helpful. And of course, coupled with uh, the increase of the capability of the, 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 the uh, informatics uh, and measuring uh, of the parameters, uh, the speed of calculations uh, and memory of uh, the computers and so on uh, are, are going to help and make possible that these methods may be very easy coupled to uh, by sensors. I really hope that uh, there will be a lot of advances in the coming years uh, uh, thanks to the coupling of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning with diagnostics, with nanobiosensors. And in fact, uh, we have plans in this direction. And of course, we'll collaborate uh, with experts in the field uh, that uh, uh, will be very, very important for addressing very challenging uh, uh, diagnostic applications in relation to health and also uh, safety and security. So I know you said in the coming years, so I, I was just wanting to get a little bit more information there. Is this something that is like being used now, like the incorporation of ML into more accurate diagnoses, more predictive diagnoses, or how many years are we away from this being uh, incorporated in full force? This is, uh, should be seen case by case. Uh, uh, there, there have been already efforts in using, for example, machine learning, in uh, some sensors where you need to train these sensors because uh, uh, the only way to make use of these sensors that are addressing, for example, some very complex uh, uh, situation is by uh, training the system. But the problem is that still this, uh, you have this system somehow 
uh, not that uh, compact. Uh, so to have this system compact, uh, you need to have all the system incorporated, for example, in, a, in an app uh, with your smartphone, for example. And this means a lot of uh, integration, a lot of uh, robustness of the system uh, in, in, in a way that uh, this uh, uh, nanobiosensing detection system and the generated data are in a very fast mode uh, taken by the system, which is previously trained, uh, so you can have a very fast response. So uh, I really don't know. I cannot give response to this, but uh, I, you need we need several years, I think, and uh, uh, hopefully, but I'm sure that uh, this is a good direction, uh, but I cannot say this is something immediate. You need, uh, we need uh, uh, several years uh, to, 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 to show, uh, first of all, the utility, and the robustness, and then to integrate the system, it means that we, uh, this uh, field of research uh, needs also a lot of funding, a lot of collaboration. Uh, of course, uh, industry is uh, interested in this, uh, in addition to funding for research. We call this uh, uh, technology readiness level so as to increase the TRLs uh, in a way that uh, we really demonstrate go from concept first, we need to demonstrate the concept of this uh, coupling, and then step-by-step step go to high TRL uh, until we have a, a really solid, uh, robust uh, device that incorporate uh, uh, AI and uh, ML uh, for this uh, kind of application. So it's, uh, you need some time. Yeah, but it, I mean, it seems like um, there are definitely, there's definitely progress being made. You mentioned like the proof of concept uh, trials and, and things of that nature. So um, I'm excited to see what, what the next steps are. And on, along those lines, I was just curious, what, are, what is the primary challenge um, that researchers are facing in this field? And what is, what is something that the next generation of MSc students or MSc researchers, what can they address um, in terms of designing and implementing the nano biosensors of the future? There are a lot of challenges, but I would choose uh, from the different challenges, make uh, the system integrated enough, robust, and of course, cost efficient. This is very important. And uh, this needs uh, still uh, efforts uh, uh, from the research community, but also uh, very, very important is to have this matching between the needs uh, and the research we are doing in the lab and the needs of the uh, society and end users and the industry. So we should work together because uh, this kind of devices uh, needs uh, a lot of collaboration. So uh, first of all, uh, focus on the need, uh, end users, health problems that we need to address or environmental related issues. We need a lot of still research in the uh, lab and also industry interested to bring this device uh, to the end user because uh, uh, this is uh, very, very important. Still, there is a gap between the, the, the research we are doing and the final product. So uh, filling this gap uh, uh, means that we need to work together. And uh, of course, uh, uh, funding for uh, the research uh, uh, toward higher TRL is very, very important because uh, we need to approach each other so we need to do a lot of, to put a lot of efforts in the, 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 the validation of the system integration and demonstration of the robustness of the system. Because sometimes we leave this, uh, and so far this has been one of the more, most important issues. So focus on the research, main research, uh, basic research, uh, but leaving the gap uh, uh, toward the, the real, the final applications. And of course, you said about the students uh, master students willing to work in this field. So this is an amazing field. And this is a very, very multidisciplinary field. I would suggest, uh, first of all, the people, the students that are willing to, to work in this field, uh, to, to work hard first, to study uh, with passion and uh, uh, willing to, to work in the research. And of course, uh, this uh, research needs a lot of collaboration. So be prepared uh, to work and in relation to other complementary fields. If you are a biology or uh, bachelor in biology, biochemistry, you, you are going to work also with a material scientist and also you are working with a, a clinical doctor. So collaboration in this field is very important. You cannot address these issues working alone. You need to collaborate, but first, of course, focus on your main expertise and then be prepared to work together with other people. But this is uh, 
uh, very nice. This uh, is going to be fun because, uh, uh, first of all, you are enjoying what you are doing and you'll see that uh, working together and putting your part of expertise, you may build very, very useful things that are very, very important to address important issues. I think this is amazing. I think David was about to ask you like what <laughs> advice you would have for MSCs, but it seems like you covered that very well. And I, I totally agree. I think the cross-functional collaboration aspect is very important. It's something that um, I like continue to develop in my role right now. And I wish I had like a more interdisciplinary um, experience, whether that's like the capstone project or, or other classes as well. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, David, do you have anything else to add? Any final questions? Nope. You took the wind out of my sails, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think that uh, advice is rings true to almost anything that we apply ourselves to is apply yourself, study hard and, uh, research is a great way to get into any field. So um, I think that while it's very true for you, it's very true for other fields as well. So this could resonate with everybody. So thanks so much for talking to us today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it was a pleasure. I wish uh, new students that uh, uh, have been hearing to our conversation would be motivated. And we are very happy, would be very happy to receive uh, uh, students in Barcelona Barcelona, Spain is a beautiful country. So we wish uh, uh, people will come here, and enjoy the research we are doing and also a lot of other uh, great uh, scientists working here in our institute and other places in Barcelona, in Spain. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities to do research in this very amazing field of research that are nanobiosensors for such uh, amazing applications. Yeah, absolutely. Barcelona seems beautiful and yes. David and I might be making our way to Barcelona later this year so you are tuned. welcome guys <laughs> enjoy awesome. Barcelona is amazing as a materials engineer we can make an impact in nearly every single industry but with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from so if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you believe me you're not alone I've been there done that but just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role and company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.